As you know, last Sabbath I accidentally did not record my message, but um, I made up for that this morning. I uh, recorded again without your presence. I recorded what we covered last time. And I guess my decision to uh, basically pause for a while and uh, read what Jeremiah was to replant and build, I guess that's uh, that was a good decision uh, because... Uh, Basically, many people are wonder once that the Queen Elizabeth will, once she abdicates or once she dies, many probably think that the growing Republican movement is going to cause the throne, the British monarchy, the throne, to cease to exist. However, we know that's not the truth, and that's why I wanted to ask to remind us why this is not the truth. Now, the fact that there might be some more demise in the Commonwealth or more members in the Commonwealth, uh, uh, leading Commonwealth, we can see from the article that I've just uh, I've just read and I've just received, and uh, it was published by Sydney Sydney Morning Herald, and the article was published <coughs> yesterday. The title is "Prince Charles tells Commonwealth nations becoming a republic is up to them." And here is the quote from Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. Kigali, Prince Charles has told Commonwealth countries considering becoming a republic that it is. For them to decide that, that cutting cords with the British monarchy can be done calmly and without rancor. Opening the first Commonwealth heads of government meeting as head of the Commonwealth in Kigali, Rwanda, Charles acknowledged growing Republican movements in some member states. These include countries in the Caribbean and more recently Australia, following the appointment of Matt Thistle Dwight as the first ever assistant minister for the Republic. Charles did not single out any country, quote, The Commonwealth contains within it countries that have had constitutional relationships with my family, some that continue to do so, and increasingly those that have none. I want to say clearly, as I've said before, that each member of uh, member's constitutional arrangement as republic or monarchy is purely a matter for each member country to decide. The benefit of long life brings me the experience that arrangements such as these can change calmly and without rancor, the 73 years old said. Barbados ditched the monarchy last year and Jamaica, which wants slavery reparations, has said it intends to follow suit. Charles said that new way to acknowledge the past wrongs of slavery were needed, and then the uh, article continues. So, you see, there are those brethren who think that the monarchy, the British monarchy, will ne- inevitably come to the end. Well, we know that that will not be so, and that's why I wanted on this, in this month, while it is the uh, Platinum Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth, the longest ruling uh, monarch on the British throne, I wanted us to remind ourselves of the origin of that throne, because the history of that throne goes far, far back into the past. Far, far back into the past. So, uh, the um, last Sabbath message you should find, hopefully, up online very soon. And this is the second one that I wanted to continue on the theme. We mentioned the stone, the stone of Israel. The stone that Dr. Bob Till also referred to recently as he made the program while visiting Ireland. And we, we I reminded you last Sabbath that the stone of Israel was the... Uh, Jacob's pillow stone, the one where he rested his head when he was in the wilderness. And then we reminded, we were reading the Bible, how he anointed that stone. It was a memorial stone. And that stone was with the Israelites as they left Egypt. They, the stone itself left Egypt with them. And after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the children of Israel, brethren, entered into the land of Canaan, and they established what we might call the United Kingdom of Israel, because you might remember that with King David, all the 12 tribes were united in one country. Later, after he, after David's son Solomon's life came to an end, uh, the United Unified uh, Kingdom was divided into two parts. The first part was the Northern Kingdom of Samaria, composed of the ten tribes, and the second part was the uh, kingdom of Judah, comprised of, of course, of the Jewish people, of the Jewish nation that lived in the south, and with them there was another tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. Now, a special stone, or pillar, indeed plays an important part in the building of the house of God in United Israel. The house was known as Solomon's first temple. You might be surprised to know that Masonic tradition 
speaks of a stone called Jacob's Pillar. It's in the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry of 1921. Now, of course, Freemasonry, as any other world religion, is a wrong religion. But you see, in any wrong religion, very often we find at least some truth. So this is one of those. Uh, in those in that in their encyclopedia, they speak about Jacob's Pillar, which was rejected by the builders. And not only was this stone in the rough, but it contained a crack, which possibly could have split the stone in two pieces at any moment. And then it is further prophetically intimated that early in the building of the temple, the attention of the architects had been incidentally invited to this very stone for use in the temple. And after inspecting the stone, the builders, they basically condemned it as unfit for any such purpose. And how builders condemned it and rejected the stone, you can find in Psalm 118, verse 22, and also in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 11. And thus neglected and despised by the builders, that stone brethren had remained in the tabernacle. Now, by the close of the seven and a half years temple reconstruction, the stone had become practically forgotten. And it seems always to have been, you know, used in tab tabernacle worship, for some religious purposes, but now that grandier provisions had been made in Jerusalem for the ritual ceremony, it was clearly in danger of being set aside. Now man, of course, man has rejected the uh, the stone, and uh, man rejected the relic, but God had provided otherwise. Uh, so just at the moment when the tabernacle was to be taken down and packed up for the march to the temple, all of a sudden, you know, this stone appears to have been given unmistakable evidence of its own peculiar and inestimable worth. Now, how the stone so suddenly became so important, so relevant, you know, how all of a sudden it struck all the concerns with astonishment and, and admiration, we really don't know. We can only guess, you know, we can just, you know, speculate. Why not? I'm not against speculations when they're based on the Bible and Bible revelation. So we can only speculate, but perhaps the stone itself may have spoken, because, you know, in the Bible we have some other strange things recorded as facts, like in Numbers 22, when Balaam's donkey, you know, spoke up all of a sudden. <laughs> Interestingly, he was not astonished. He was not completely taken by surprise that a, you know, dumb animal has spoken to him, he just took it as something normal. He just responded to the donkey, you know, why he was beating her. So, uh, such strange thing, even stranger than the stone, was recorded in the Bible indeed. At Kadesh, or Kadesh, Moses had been directed by God to speak to this very same stone, which is recorded in Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 and beyond. And also Moses sinned by smiting that stone as he had at Horeb. So this later time, you know, he acted both in wrath and perhaps in pride, saying, shall we bring forth what in reality God alone could cause only to happen to flow? So if the stone could hear, so to speak, why not speak upon some particular occasion? Even Jesus Christ was rebuked by the Pharisees when he was entering Jerusalem on a donkey. They rebuked him to quite his followers who were triumphantly you know, uh, crying out during his triumphant ride into Jerusalem. And when they tried to, you know, and, 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 and tell him, please quiet your, 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 your followers, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, verse 40, we read that Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Well, that is what we know. We don't really understand how the stone became so relevant. Perhaps it clamored. It might have spoken. There are even some incidents written in the Irish chronologies that every time the uh, rightful heir of the throne, a descendant of King David, was coronated, the stone would make some interesting noise. And it was silent or it would make a noise when a fake descendant of King David would try to be coronated. I can't now remember exactly what was the story, but the the, the sound, the, the sound, I mean, the uh, the stone, the pillar stone could make some sound, you see, according to some traditions. So therefore, perhaps it was this p 
pillow of Jacob that basically clamored and then it was included into the uh, big temple. Newly built temple and it became the uh, embedded basically on the coronation chair, which is very, very interesting and very relevant because even to this day, in the coronation ceremony, the stone is always there. And upon that stone, we can see the coronation of all the rulers in the current lost Israel. Now, in the coronation of the king of Israel, we find again a special stone or pillar which was playing an important role in ancient Israel. When Joash was brought forth and proclaimed the heir of King David's throne, he was anointed a king. And then we have, in this is in Second Kings chapter 11, verse 13 and 14, we have this uh, account. And here it says the following, 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 13. And when Ataliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manner was. Now, in the Revised Standard Version, it says, standing by the pillar, as was the custom. And the article, the, denoted a particular pillar by or upon which it was the custom of Israel to crown their kings. Uh, famous Adam Clark, uh, one of the one of those commentators on the Bible, he comments on this expression stood on a pillar. He says that the place it is a place or throne on which they were accustomed to put their kings when they proclaimed them. So, you know, uh, we have in Second Chronicles chapter 23, verse 13, a uh, recapitulation of the circumstances concerning Yoash, which in that uh, account, we read this interesting statement. And she looked at Aliyah, and she looked, and behold, the king stood at the pillar. And again, this, this indicates it was a particular pillar belonging to those who were anointing anointing, uh, belonging to those who were anointed king, but also it was well known to the others who were, you know, participating in the coronation ceremony. In the Companion, companion Bible, the, there is an alternate rendering. It says, upon that Yoash stood upon the pillar, and it is reasonable to assume that, you know, he stood upon the stone which Jacob had set up as a pillar when he made his covenant with God. Indeed, Israel was familiar with the history of the Beth El stone, and Israel knew it was the house of God to Jacob, and it had become the guardian stone of Israel. And thus the king could have chosen no more fitting place for making his covenant to restore the law and its administration to Israel. You know, it was a sacred stone, and it was witnessed all, it, you know, it had witnessed all of the various many solemn compacts or alliances between God and his people. Now, the stone which was refused by the builders of Solomon's temple, it did become head of the corner, and the pillar or coronation stone on which the kings of the house of David were crowned. The first attitude you know, of the builders toward the stone was indeed prophetic of the attitude of rejection of Jesus Christ. The chief priests of Judean people have reject, had rejected them, and also, of course, the Jewish nation as a whole, they also rejected him and plus other races. Now what happened to the this coronation stone when the captivity of Israel took place starting in 745 before Christ? Now please make distinction, brethren, between the, cap between the captivity of Israel and captivity of Judah. Israel fell captive uh, well beyond Judah and... Uh, Judah, you know, Judah was later, 136 later, Judah was conquered by the Babylonians. So basically, the Assyrians first were the ones who assaulted the uh, northern ten tribes and took them into captivity. But, uh, you know, what happened to this coronation stone when that captivity of Israel took place starting in 745 before Christ? Well, Brethren, the Bible purposely makes little mention of the stone as such, and then only in a secondary way, 
well, perhaps to guard against the tendency to make an idol of it. Also, it seems that God intended for the identity of the stone and the people connected with it to be hidden from the world for a time. And however, it is still logical to assume that the custody of the stone would remain in the hands of some part of the people of Israel. And indeed, between 745 and 721 before Christ, we know the northern ten tribes basically uh, known also as the house of Israel that they together with a larger portion of the southern kingdom of Judah known as the house of Judah they were taken into Assyrian captivity uh, the account of this is found in 2nd Kings chapter 17 verse 3 through 6 now also there are archaeological archaeological tablets that are found in the excavations of the Assyrian royal library at Nineveh and those tablets revealed or, or at least they have indicated, you know, that a majority of the Israelites escaped. Some traveled through the southern end of the north of the Black Sea into the Daniel River Valley and the Carpathian Mountains. You know, others went by way of Darial Pass through the Caucasus Mountains into the steeps or steppes of southern Russia. So there are many lost Israelites in southern Russia in particular. But the confirmation of the escape of Israelites from Assyrian captivity is found in the writings of the prophet Ezra. And after the ten tribes, the house of Israel, refused the request of King Xerxes to return to Jerusalem to join the remnant of Judah from Babylon, Ezra wrote concerning you know, their movements and, 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 and he, he basically wrote that in the book Second Ezra chapter 13. Now of course this is an extra biblical book. It is one of those historical books, but indeed their accuracy has been proven right. So therefore, in uh, his account of the uh, scattering of Israelites, Ezra, in chapter 13, uh, speaks that uh, those are the ten tribes who are very peacefully gathered uh, uh, before, you know, well, on the other side of the Euphrates River. And uh, he writes that those captives were taken away prisoner of out of their land in the time of Osea, the king, whom Shalmanasa, the king of Assyria, led away captive, and he carried, you know, all other Israelites over the waters, and so come that they... Uh, so so came that they, they, they were actually going to another land, you see. However, they took the counsel among themselves, it says, and they decided to leave the multitude of heathens and go forth into further country where never mankind, humankind dwelt, that they might, you know, there keep their statues, which they never kept in their own in their own land, in their own home. And they entered into the Euphrates, says Ezra's, Second Ezra, by the narrow passages of the flood, until they were passed over. For those, for through that country, there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half. And the same region is called Arsareth. Arsareth. So this was Second Ezra, chapter thirty, verses thirty-nine through forty-five. But what we have just read in this extra biblical book is indeed in harmony with what is written in the Bible itself and it's written in Micah chapter 2 verse 12 and 13. Micah chapter 2 verse 12. I'll surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. I'll surely gather the remnant of Israel. I'll put them together as the sheep of Borak, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The broker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate, and the gate out by it. And their king shall pass before them, and the lord of the land of the head of them. Now this is interesting that, you know, basically we have this clause, they have passed through the gate. And in Micah and in Ezra it says they have entered into the narrow passages. Well, those two accounts are parallel and refer to the same circumstance and place. Because this gate or narrow, narrow passage which is up among the, you know, 
head, head, uh, up among the heady waters of the Euphrates. Today it's known as Caucasian Pass. Some people call it the Pass of Israel. And so uh, in the prophet Hosea, in Hosea chapter 3 verse 4, prophet Hosea says the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a sacrifice and without an image or as the marginal reading gives us, without a standing pillar. Well, Brethren Young's exhaustive concordance gives, among other definitions of the original Hebrew word, both memorial stone and pillar. Now, other authorities give up pillar rock, or they give us pillar rock, they give us pillar stone as the rendering, and that would be, according to their view, a correct rendering of this of this verse. So, uh, they give us this kind of this kind of uh, explanation indeed. But with this image mentioned in Hosea 3, 4, uh, we see that Israel will be long without this, this standing pillar, without that image, the, the word image is actually better translated standing pillar or a pillar. Now it was, men, men, it was thought by the king of uh, Babylon and others that once the uh, Jewish king Zedekiah was overthrown and once he was taken into captivity, it was believed that once all of his sons were slaughtered and all the other noble men, it was thought, you know, by the enemy that they have finally destroyed, you know, the uh, kingdom of Judah and they thought that finally the, the Jewish kingdom will never again rise because all the male descendants and all the male heirs are no longer there, indeed. So, uh, for a long time, Israel was to be without a standing pillar. Now, when Jerusalem was taken by the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and the temple was destroyed, there was every probability that the throne of David would become vacant. Because Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, had fled. As you know, he was captured later, and his eyes put out and his children slid or killed right before, their, right before his eyes. But the king's daughters were spared, and there are several later references to king, king's daughters. Well, in Jeremiah 41, verse 10 through 17, and in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 6, we read about those two daughters. The Bible doesn't give us indication how many of daughters were, nor does it give us any details about their birth, but we do know it's a clean, it's a clean hood anyway, and we do know that uh, those daughters were the ones to continue the uh, line of David. You see, Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, reigned only for only 11 years. By most scholars, he is considered to be the last king of the Judah-David line to reign over any part of the Israel people. However, God has said that he would build up David's throne unto the generations. In 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 5, and also in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. So 1 Kings 9, 5. Uh, God said basically that to David that he will establish his throne for all the generations. Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of David. And prior to that, also in Genesis 49, when Jacob was dying, he gave this prophecy to Joseph, his son. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, that is from the, uh, from the posterity of Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, from uh, between his feet unto Shiloh come. Shiloh is the Shiloh in Hebrew and it's Messiah. And it's from Genesis 49 verse 10 nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him, which is unto Shiloh, the gathering of the people be. That's in Genesis 49, verse 10. So, brethren, though though the throne ceased in, 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 the, uh, in the land of Canaan, when Zedekiah died as a captive in Babylon, there must be, of necessity, there must be a continuation of that throne. There must be ruler of the house of David, indeed, reigning over at least a portion of the house of Israel. And since Zedekiah's sons were killed, there were no male heirs to the throne of Judah. However, it was under Hebrew law, which is very clear in Numbers 27, 
So under the under Hebrew law, a daughter would not inherit as though she were a son, would inherit, that is, as though she were a son, and the right of the descent would pass on to her male seed, providing that she married within one, one her own house. So these regulations were in place in Israel, but of course Babylonians would not have would not be aware of those. So even though the Babylonians thought that there was no longer an heir, a male heir, to continue the uh, uh, the genealogy of David, that was not true. Yes, there were, you know, indeed descendants ready for that throne. Now, uh, Nebuchadnezzar thought that, you know, he basically secured that never again there will be a ruler from the, from the house of David on the throne of David. However, the king's daughters in the company of Jeremiah, they did escape with a remnant of Judah to the land of Egypt. You see, Jeremiah, with the daughters, found sanctuary with the Milesian king, Milesian garrison. It was a Greek mercenaries who served there. And uh, according to secular records, it was all happened, uh, uh, and uh, according to the records, was it, it was all stationed that the records were all stating that it will be toughness, toughness in Egypt. You can find that place in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 5, 6, and 7. Indeed, so, basically, the things happen as they should. The king's daughter in company, in company of Jeremiah, they did escape with a remnant of Judah to the land of Egypt. And Jeremiah, with the daughters, found sanctuary with the Greek mercenaries, Milesians. It, there was a garrison of Milesians, the Greek mercenaries, which, according to sec secular records, it was stationed in the city of Tafnes in the city of Tathnes in Egypt. Now in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 5 through 7, you may just find the description of uh, that very uh, palace where the two sisters, two uh, daughters, daughters, king, two daughters, uh, two king's daughters, I wanted to say, found refuge. Now Tathnes, you know, Tathnes was an interesting city on the border. It was identified as a Greek fortress. Daphne, and it was uh, on the Karen road from Egypt to the land of Canaan. And for traveling and commercial purposes, the fortress was near the frontier of Egypt. However, after reaching the fort, a traveler must traverse another 240 kilometers, you know, through the wilderness desert and before, uh, before reaching the gardens of Gaza. Now, we are in a position that we can understand the politics of the time and the importance of toughness, you know. Toughness was a borderline to be a uh, fence, uh, a line of defense against possibly Assyria, well, which was on rise at that time. Uh, toughness was built as a border fortress and it was basically manned by Greek mercenaries against the then rising powers of the Assyrian Empire. So it was before... The most natural thing for the Hebrews escaping from the vengeance of the Assyrians, most natural way for them was to flee to the safety of the Greek garrison over the border. Now when Jeremiah and the Hebrew king's daughters were fleeing the Babylon, they would have also fled to this nearby place of safety and doubtless they would have appealed to the king of Egypt for some help. Now, the Pharaoh Hophra, the Pharaoh Hophra indeed was uh, an honest person and uh, basically had come recently in 589 to the throne of, of Egypt. He was in alliance with Judah and from there the Babylonians had beaten him off and uh, they destroyed Jerusalem in 588 before before Christ or 586. So to a figurative royalty royal party from Jerusalem, he might be expected to show friendship and goodwill. Now, brethren, their prophecies of Jeremiah, they're very remarkable for their variety of application. You see, because not only do these prophecies cover a lengthy period of time, extending from, you know, immediate, uh, from the then immediate future until the end of this age, 
But some of them, some of those Jeremiah's prophecies also concern specific individuals, like that fair Hophra, who was a foreigner, he was not, uh, uh, he was not native of Egypt, but he was the ruler that was later toppled by various people. It was toppled and, uh, he was deposed, and Hophra's successor, Achemes, he was driving the Greek settlers and garrisons out of Egypt, and, uh, they were, he was persecuting them because they were supposedly uh, supporting his rival. And therefore, this process weakened the country of, uh, of Greece and prepared the way for Nebuchadnezzar's invasion predicted by Jeremiah. Uh, yes, prediction by Jeremiah is in the books of Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, let's see, that would be verse 10 and 11. Of chapter 43. Behold, I'll send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will set his throne upon these stones I have hid. And when he comes and shall smite the land of Egypt and deliver such as, as are for death and such as are for captivity and such as are just the sword, uh, just the just they are just for the sword and to the sword. Now this was in Jeremiah 43 verses 10 and 11. But you see, Jeremiah also prophesied that the Israelites who fled to Egypt to escape the Babylonians would not escape God's judgment later, you see. They were not because in Jeremiah 44, we see verse 26 and 27. Jeremiah 20, uh, 44 verse 26. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah, that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says uh, the Lord, that my enemy shall no more be named in the mouth of any mean or Judah, all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God lives. Behold, I'll watch over him for evil and not for good, and the men of Judah that are in the midst of the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword, which by the sword and by the famine, we, until there is no end to be found of them. Now this was you know, uh, all explained to us in Jeremiah chapter 44. In any way, following this statement, following this judgment, one was to promote that a, you know, uh, that a mind, that a person uh, would escape. So Jeremiah 44 verse 14, for none shall return but such as shall escape. Which indicates, this is Jeremiah 44 verse 14, that indicates that a small remnant would escape the desolation and destru destruction and the devastation uh, and that they would uh, put the uh, this world of this desolation and death behind his, behind his back and understand that the descendants upon, uh, their descendants upon Egypt for none shall return, but such as shall remnant would escape. This is the prophecy, Jeremiah 44, verse 14. So, there is no reason again to fear, but everything under God's control, and He's working out His plan that He, ha that he, he has. Earlier, God had promised Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 15, verse 11, Jeremiah 15, verse 11, you know, God promised Promise Jeremiah, you verily it shall be used with the remnant. Verily I'll cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and one in the day of affliction. Now this was in Jeremiah fifteen eleven. Now this statement is followed by the promise that Jeremiah would pass into a land which he did not know. In Jeremiah fifteen verse fourteen. And I'll make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which you know knows not. So we have also prophecy in Isaiah, prophecy of Isaiah about the remnant that was to go forth from Jeremiah and from Jerusalem that is and to escape. And it says, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again to recruit downward and bear fruits, fruit stone. And there is also, you know, uh, uh, another account of Jeremiah 
Because this that we have just read in uh, Isaiah 37, it fits in with Jeremiah's divine, uh, divine commission. In Jeremiah 1.10 it says, See, I have this day set the over, set, set the over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to, out and to, uh, to root out, pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. That was in Jeremiah 1.10. We read about the sacred commission that Jeremiah had. Now this remnant, which was also to escape, was not the remnant that was left by Nebuchadnezzar in the land of Judah, nor the entire remnant that went down into Egypt to dwell, but it was Jeremiah's own particular little remnant, you know, a small selected company that has been that's been given that selected company that he was given to him, obviously for a purpose, and uh, it was given to him to do the planting and building. And since this planting and building was to take place in a land that Jerusalem and the Jeremiah did not know, it could not have been in Egypt or in the Canaanite land or in Babylon or whatever you know, whatever region you might might come up with. It could not be any of those regions around the, uh, the, the the promised land, because you know it was on fire and it was known region to uh, the one who was to do the uh, translation translation or or uh, uh, changing of of the throne. So Jeremiah could not you know he could not pass that throne uh, to any of those surrounding countries surrounding the, uh, the 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 promised land. The expression to pass is significant, for it implies travel by sea, passage by boat. And that's exactly what Jeremiah did. He underwent traveling by sea with king's daughters in transplanting the stone of Israel. Now the Bible records Jeremiah fulfilling so the first part of the commission when he had the uh, commission that uh, he was to build and to plant. So there is no secret that planting and building, moreover, was to be a distant foreign land to which God declared Jeremiah would go, you know, with his remnant. Now, we need to turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 17. Before that, I just want to remind you that upon leaving Egypt, Jeremiah would doubtless have had in his possession the stone of Beth El, the symbolical throne of David. And the stone was a witness of promises still to come, and of course, which of which some of which even today they are still waiting fulfillment. Now certainly what God commissioned uh, Jeremiah, God's indeed divine providence would not allow this witness to suffer destruction or fall into the sacrilegious hands. Jeremiah 17, now Ezekiel 17 that is. Now the scripture doesn't tell us about uh, Jeremiah's whereabouts after describing his journey to Egypt. But we have every reason to believe that God would see to it that he was preserved to accomplish, you know, to accomplish the building and planting which he was commissioned to do. Now the daughters of King Zedekiah became the prophet's words. Now we've because God had promised that his covenant with David would not be broken and that David would never lack a seed to reign upon his throne, the building and planting obviously had to do with preserving this royal branch of the house of David indeed. Now this brings us to a very important question. What happened to this royal party after they left Egypt? In other words, where did they go? And one important clue is found in the riddle of Ezekiel chapter 17. Ezekiel chapter 17 verse 1. And take riddle and speak a parable unto the house of Israel and say, Thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long wingered, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came into Lebanon and young twigs and carried it into a land of traffics. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also the seed of Jesus and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by a great waters and set it a willow tree. 
and it grew and it and became a spreading wise lot of stature whose branches turned toward him and the root, root, roots thereof went under him. So it became a wine and brought forth branch and short also short uh, so brought forth branches and shot forth springs. That's what it says. So this is from Ezekiel chapter 17 verses 1 through 6. You see this was the riddle. And uh, these first verses of the parable introduced a great eagle. It's used by the prophets. It symbolized the Babylonian ruler. Because you know the Gentile succession of, uh, of empires which is in the end of chapter 2 is destined to control the world during the absence of Israel from her own land. Now, the eagle was an Assyrian emblem, that, and this fact is probably referred to in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 8. The eagle-headed deity of the Assyrian sculptures is that of God Nisroch, and when they represent the battles and the battle stages, uh, trained birds of that order are frequently shown accompanying the, Israel, the Assyrians as they go into the battle. And also what happened was that Nebuchadnezzar invaded Lebanon, which was home of the famous cedar trees in southern Syria. And this was the home of the Hebrew patriarchs after their migration from Mesopotamia, where Isaac and Jacob later obtained their wives. You see, the royal dynasty of Israel you know, might be likened unto a great cedar of Lebanon. Now the highest branches of the cedar and the top of these young twigs uh, represent King Jehoiachin and his princes and the princes of Judah removed to Babylon in the uh, land of traffic. Now Nebuchadnezzar was the world dictator and that, you know, dictator, he also took of the seed of the land and planted it as a willow tree in a fruitful field by great waters. That's prophecy of Ezekiel 17, verse 5. You see, brethren, vast numbers of willow line, they line the waterways of Mesopotamia. The roots of the trees help to hold the muddy banks together. And in this respect, it is a fitting symbol of a country that depended for its existence upon irrigation and waterborne trade, as did Mesopotamia in the general and Babylonian in particular. Now, after Jehoiakim was taken to Babylon, his brother Sedekiah was made a puppet ruler of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Sedekiah was indeed, he was planted figuratively by the great waters of the Euphrates, upon which he took was to depend for his existence. Now this seed of the cedar tree, planted like a willow of Babylon, it became a wine, and brought forth branches, and shot forth springs. Now here is a, a, an ingenious intermingling of national symbols. The cedar, typifying the house of David, was set up to grow with as Babylonian's willow, and as a wine, which is the symbol of Joseph and the birthright. Now, all this was done as part of, not only, uh, well, not only of, uh, of the goodwill, but it was basically done as a part of Nebuchadnezzar's great plan to establish sovereignty over Israel. Because this puppet state became only a wine of low statue. Now, it could not compare with the former exalted state of the servant nation, for out of all twelve tribes of Israel, only a badly shattered remnant of the kingdom of Judah was left, indeed. And then the riddle continues with the introduction of another great eagle. We read from verse, it's Ezekiel 17, verse 7 through 10. There was also another great eagle with great wings and many feathers. And behold, the wine did bend her roots toward him, and shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the uh, furrows of his plantation. It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, and that it might be a goodly wine. Say that, say thus, thus says the Lord God, shall it prosper? 
Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruits of uh, of 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 uh, the fruits thereof? That is wither. Oh, this old English language. But anyway, it shall re- it, it shall wither in all in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power of many or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Yeah, behold, being planted, shall it proper prosper? Shall it not utterly wither when the east wind touches of it? Shall wither in the furrow, furrows where it grew? Well, we have now the second eagle. The second eagle was the pharaoh of Egypt who was approached by Zedekiah, the last king uh, on the throne of Judah. Zedekiah was approaching the, this king in hope of deliverance from the Babylonian king. The Egyptians indeed sent a force to assist Zedekiah and his sons were however taken to Babylon to meet their unhappy end and Jerusalem was destroyed. Now this was rather a dreadful fulfillment. The roots of the plant were torn up and its fruit was cut off. Zedekiah saw his sons slain in his sight and you know then his own eyes were put out. Then the riddle continues in Ezekiel now from verse 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the builders, to the rebellious house, Know you not what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem, and has taken the king of thereof, and the princes thereof, and led them with him to Babylon, and has taken of the king's seed, and made a covenant with him. He has also taken the mighty of the land, that the kingdom might be base, that it might not lift itself up, up, but that by keeping of his sovereign it might stand. But he rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. Shall he prosper? Shall he escape that does such thing? Or shall he break the covenant one and be delivered? As I live, says the Lord, surely in the place where the king dwells that made him king whose oaths he despised and whose covenant he broke even with him in the midst of Babylon he shall die. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons. Seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant when lo, he had given his land and has done all these things, he shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath that he has despised and my covenant that he has broken, even it will I recompense upon his own head. And I'll spread my net upon him and he shall be, he shall be taken in by snare and I'll bring him to Babylon and will plead with him there for his trespass that has trespassed against me. And all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. So this was from verse 12 all the way to verse 21. Now you see the second part of this parable the second great eagle. He is now set up in contrast to the first, to the first great eagle, which saw how the aspirations of the kings of Judah were brought to naught. You know, their failures, however, were not to be allowed to annual, uh, to annul the promises of perpetuity made to the house of David. So, despite the fact that the male successor, successor, and male succession to the throne apparently ended with the death of Zedekiah's son, there was yet a method for the continuation of the royal line that that right of female succession as granted by Hebrew law. You might remember in uh, the allegory, the allegory is there employed from verse 22 onward in Ezekiel's riddle. It says, it's, it has a female link there in this uh, in this riddle. And uh, let's read this. It's in Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the high cedar and will see it. I'll crop off 
from the top of, of his young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it upon a high mountain and eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth brow, uh, boughs and bear fruit, and when and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing. In the morning, in the shadow of the branches uh, thereof shall be shall they dwell, and all the tree of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the great tree, and have made the cry. And I have made, sorry, to dry the, to flourish. And the Lord have spoken and have done it. So this was this now, the, uh, remaining of this interesting prophecy of, on the book of Ezekiel. Now in the grammatical structure of the text of verse 22, the words branch, the high its, referring to cedar, and twigs are feminine. <laughs> whereas the masculine could have been used in such case. So these feminine words should be taken as being in some way prophetically connected, brethren, since the highest rob, the highest branch, refers to the royal family of Zedekiah, uh, the high cedar. You know, the royal house of David, uh, you know, uh, basically had this tender twig, which indicates a female order of, of, of the royal family of Zedekiah, and the king's daughters would have been the only individuals who were in position to perpetuate the David's line. However, with the end of the male succession on the throne of David, as recorded in the Bible, we look for the continuation of that line in one of the king's daughters taken by Jeremiah into Egypt, and it's described in Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 6, we are not told in scripture how many king's daughters were there were, and only, or only, you know, or any of their names. Nor does the Bible give, give any historical narrative of what happened to these promises beyond telling us that they were taken, taken to Egypt with, with Jeremiah, Barak the scribe, and others. Also, we may assume that the royal line of David would be reestablished in Israel in an high mountain and eminent in the mountain future nation of the height of uh, uh, future nation of the height which is basically high place future nation of the height or the height of 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 Israel well the house of Judah was broken forever and the royal line was to be transferred brethren it was to be transferred now to the house of Israel this is entirely in keeping with the parallels of the potter's vessels. The house of Judah was commanded by Jeremiah to get a potter's earthen bottle with which he was to demonstrate the judgment upon Judah. Now Jeremiah was told, you know, to take some of the leaders among the people and the people and go to the valley opposite the pottery, the gate where he was to proclaim a message of judgment upon them for their evil ways. He was to then break the bottle into the sight, in the sight of those who went with him, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of God of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessels. As one breaks a potter's vessels cannot, cannot be made whole again. Now, as we contrast the illustration of the house of Judah, the house of Israel's conditions were that of a vessel of clay damaged in the making, you know, bust, still workable clay, capable of being reshaped. Well, it's in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 4, that this potter, <laughs> the products of pottery are described, verse 4, 5, and 6. So, we have that to establish that the house of Israel and the house of Judah as two separate and distinct nations are still there, but they are going to reunite, reunite at the return of Jesus Christ. Now, a further prophecy that uh, of the transferring of David's throne from his own 
uh, from uh, where where he was from the house of Judah, and then to this describe to to change it somewhere. Well, it did not remain secret anyway, because uh, a further prophecy says that uh, in Ezekiel chapter twenty one will have this uh, uh, throne from the house of Judah now being transferred to the house of Israel. Ezekiel 21 verse 25 And thou profane wicked prince of Israel whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end thus shall the Lord God remove the diadem and take off the crowns and this shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low, and it shall be not moral. Uh, it will be not 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 not, any, not It will not be any more low. So remove the diadem, says the Lord, and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low, and abase him that is high. And I'll overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be not more overturned until the Messiah comes, whose right it is. And I'll give it, that turn of David, to him, to the Messiah, basically. So that's why we know that the British monarchy will never cease to exist, brethren. Well, now in closing comments about this uh, prophecy of Ezekiel. In this prophecy, brethren, he accepted interpretation of the profane wicked prince, the one that was high is that he was Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now it is he who was to be brought down, but who was the low one referred to, to who was to be exalted? You know, the one that was ruled over at the, at the, the time of, uh, at the time the words were spoken. Well, to answer that question, it's necessary to return to an incident in the book of Genesis, chapter 30, 38, that chapter relates with such explicit details that you know, it must be regarded indeed as highly significant and relevant. Usually, in such cases, the dialogue foreshadows coming events. So anyway, basically, in the Bible narrative, Judah, the son of Jacob, who was to be the father of the future kings of the covenant people, he married a Canaanite woman. But the Canaanites were an abomination to the Lord because of their Baal worship and other unrighteous practices, brethren. And therefore, none of the sons of this marriage were allowed to become progenitors of the promised royal line. Two of the sons by this marriage died, and in the course of time, the Canaanitish wife also also died. Then the scripture tells of how Tamar, a woman who had been, who had, uh, you know, was she was a widow. Well, she was a widow, yes. She was living a sol solitary life. But she was a woman who had been living a celibate life for years. And nevertheless, she longed for motherhood. And then she became a mother of twins, not only one, but two. She became mother of twins, mother of twin boys, and uh, that fact is also very, very meaningful to us. Because the recorded incidents concerning the birth of, of, of uh, Jacob's sons uh, was, well, you know, there were the twins all of a sudden, and Tamar was a celibate for, celibate for years, she wanted to be a mother. She became the mother of the twins of Judah. And the recorded incidents concerning the birth of Judah's twins boys are also very meaningful because the midwife in such case to distinguish boys, to distinguish who will be the older one, she basically, uh, because she needed to determine who would be the older one for the, for the right of inheritance, she had made ready a scarlet thread which well, she tried with that to mark the one who should be the rightful heir. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 38, verse 28. Genesis 38, verse 28, and the, the birth of the twin brothers, sons of Judah. And it came to pass, when she traveled, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. 
And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out. And she said, How hast thou broken forth? Now this breach be upon thee, therefore his name was called Phares. And then afterwards, you know, came out, or, or, well, afterwards came out he, uh, his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name called Zera, or Zara. You see, this, there could be no other significance here than that the both of these twins were to be inheritors of the birthright somewhere along the line of descendants. Now, naturally, far as the firstborn, he was to come first. And it was from him that David, the first king from the tribe of Judah, descended. Saul, on the other hand, was the first king over the twelve tribes of Israel. He was a Benjamite. But the midwife said, you see, this breach be upon thee. Moffat translates this as, what a breach you have made for yourself. Now, this would clearly indicate that somewhere in descent, somewhere in descent of the forest land, there would be a break in the sequence, in the sequence of those who inherited the throne. We'll come to Zara next time. Just wanted to mention to you that the royal line of Pharis established in David was unbroken until the command of the Lord was given concerning Zedekiah. And the, land, the uh, commandment was, was, was very explicit. Take off the crown, exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. Now when Zedekiah was dethroned and all his stones were slain, were slain, there certainly was a breach in the line of Pharis. For not another king has reigned over the tribe of Judah. But as, as, as we have seen, a daughter was to be planted in a distant land. However, the command was to exalt him that was low or the non-ruling line of Judah. Now this had to be Zara, the prince of the scarlet, the prince of the scarlet court. In other words, the Zara branch of the royal family of Judah seemed destined to supersede the Pharaoh's branch. And so the next time we're going to look into the Prince of the Scarlet Thread, whose name is Zara.